All right, I guess I'll, um, I'll get us started. Oh, and let it come by. Welcome, everyone. I guess I can start by saying uh, Happy New Year and uh, <laughs> to a new academic term in some respects. I guess it's not that new anymore, but uh, first I want to thank you for taking time to uh, share your insights uh, for this teaching and learning town hall. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Dr. Aaron Corvax, our Senior Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs and her, her leadership and our Provost fe Fellow, Rich Franco for actually working together and a whole host of other people working together to try to understand um, how we can enhance our environment at Drexel for, for teaching and learning. So um, Barbara Hornham for over a decade served in the role for the um, Drexel Center for Academic Excellence where we've had the opportunity to have these broad conversations with regards to how we can enhance our pedagogy across the campus, among other things, even some of the more provocative issues they addressed. Um, it just felt like a good time when we hired a new, we created the role of Senior Vice Provost Faculty Affairs to kind of rethink and look to uh, what may be additional contemporary areas in that, in, in that arena. I, um, you know, I've had a rich history in teaching and learning. There's a, I could not tell you what the acronym stands for, but there's a center called Candles at Georgetown that was just, you know, it, it, I remember engaging with them really early on in my term as an assistant professor. Because um, I, I, I remember being completely scared. I, my first um, role as being an adjunct professor, uh, I'd never had any teaching experience before. And I remember not even thinking about how it would be. I put together some PowerPoint slides and, you know, I was ready to go. I remember distinctly the afternoon when I was going to teach the first class. It was going to be at 5 o'clock because uh, I was still working full time. And uh, I remember turning to us, well, I should look and see how people teach. And, you know, I turned to PBS. And there was this uh, physics professor. And he had the stool. He was spinning the stool. And he was blowing up things. I was like, oh, man, I'm not going to be good. <laughs> so it's going to be really tough because I don't have any of that stuff. So um, I think what, you, what we can find is that for establish one is this community is going to help us figure out what's the best embodiment for enhancing these types of things for Drexel. And then two, I just, I just you know, think that we have so much to offer. We have such a rich environment you know, for experiential learning, uh, kind of what we do in cooperative education, the breadth of schools and colleges. Um, we have a whole body of exceptional faculty that really um, are very passionate and compelled for our students. So I think this will give us the, the chance to really take all of that in and think about you know, what sort of center or what sort of um, organization we should have in this particular area. So I want to thank you for taking time again. I'm going to get out of everyone's hair and way and say I look forward to what we learn from today's uh, actions. I guess there's going to be a couple other targeted groups later. Um, but thank you so much. With that, um, what I'd like to do is briefly just take a minute to talk about what we've done so far in terms of learning about what's going on on campus and cataloging what we've got. We'll just take about five minutes or so for Richard and I to talk about what we've been doing to learn about what's happening here at Drexel um, and where we are in this process. And then we're just going to open it up for discussion. So um, this is a, just a really rough outline of what we're trying to do. Um, Richard's been holding stakeholder meetings, which he'll talk about. Um, with folks around campus from uh, Castle to the writing program. There's um, sort of teaching and le learning units embedded in different schools and colleges. And he's been meeting with those stakeholders. Right now we're having open forums. That's what this is, to hear about people's hopes and dreams for our teaching and learning center. Um, and then we're going to narrow that down with an envisioning process. Um, and tomorrow, actually, as you may know, is the deadline for nominations for the, I think we called it the Envisioning Committee. Um, it's going to work uh, really hard over a few months with us um, to develop a draft vision and mission for a teaching and learning center um, and a, and a uh, job description for an inaugural director. Um, so that's just generally the process. I'll let Richard talk about what he's, who he's met with and what he's learned. Oh, sure. Okay. 
So this is, this is just a um, representative sample of uh, different groups of stakeholders or uh, parts of the university um, that have uh, involvement in teach teaching and learning uh, that we've met with over the course of the last, uh, I guess I would say, I'm, I'm on the semester system as yeah. well, so I think I'm thinking semesters, but I guess it's over the last quarter or quarter and a half, or yeah. however you uh, slice and dice it. Um, but this is obviously, this is not, not everything, and some, some groups have been added or some are still to be scheduled. Um, just to learn about what, um, what someone should already know about the university before you go ahead and start designing a teaching and learning center about what initiatives are already being undertaken, what ideas people have uh, for what would be effective here at Drexel. Right, and so, this, oh, go ahead. No, and, uh, so, right, this is, this is just a little bit of, of, of what we've learned, I think, from, or from, from those meetings and, and what we hope to learn more of. Um, one, it was just, it's been very striking just how much enthusiasm there is for a dedicated teaching and learning center here um, from the people that I've spoken with and the opportunities for um, either to showcase what, what folks are already doing here at the university or to, to bring uh, people together to support teaching and learning. Um, the second point uh, was variety. Uh, one of the things that has been emphasized um, from people that we've met with is it's important to have a diversity of programming and offerings and um, uh, 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 functioning to reach sort of the, as many people at the university as possible is making the center something that really s speaks to everyone and that everyone would have um, uh, an interest in. Um, and then uh, third uh, is ambition. I guess that should be first because ambition doesn't wait. That's but, right. Uh, right. That's right. <laughs> but uh, 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 that there's, you know, we're a leader in, in uh, Drexel is a leader in, in various areas of teaching and learning. Uh, uh, already, and there's no reason why this, uh, we can't be a leader in this area as well. Great, thanks. So that's just a oh, flyby of what, what Richard's been learning. Um, but what we'd like to hear about are your sort of aspirations for a teaching and learning center. What are your hopes? What are your concerns about a, the development of a teaching and learning center? And answer any questions. And that doesn't necessarily capture it all, but that's what I could come up with this morning as a way of framing um, what we might be talking about. Um, so with that, we will stop talking and um, would love to hear about your thoughts about the Teaching and Learning Center, what you think it might be, what your concerns are, any questions that you have either about the process or about um, what we might build together. And there are two people with mics, Antonis Esbrakis, Mike, who I, and actually I should take a minute, I didn't introduce my team. Antonis Esbrakis is Director of Policy and Operations, Linda Gribbs is the, our Administrative Assistant, and Alonda Green, Director of Development and Diversity, who's going to be doing our note taking today to capture everything that, that we get out of this room. So, um, and Thomas and Linda have mics, which I would ask you to use because we're live streaming this, um, which reminds me to also say this is our first of two face to face town halls. We're scheduling a third completely online town hall. Um, and do we, don't, we don't have a date for that yet, do we? No, we're still working. No, we're working with the um, TAG group to, to get that set up um, uh, through Drexel Online. Um, so, so that'll be, that'll be coming, the committee. Yeah, I'm, the envisioning committee? Yeah, the deadline? Yeah, I mentioned that, yeah. So, the floor is yours. Hi, I'm Lawrence Souter. I'm in the Department of Communication. I've been here since 1999, and um, I, I find that uh, Drexel has a wonderful, um, wonderful resources for, for the classroom and uh, wonderful support for the online services. The thing that I'm always uh, looking for are examples of good practice. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know what my colleagues are doing that, that's working and, um, and maybe learn from that. Mm -hmm. So the Teaching and Learning Center could be a place where we share great good practices and a, sort of a almost like a lab of sorts where we can see what people are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, I saw your hand was up. No? Yeah? It just was. Not yet. Okay. Hi. Hi um, my name's Eileen Shanahan. I am an instructional designer uh, at Duo. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot is accessibility, especially for online courses. And I know there are different uh, groups around the university working on 
how do we make new courses accessible, what do we do about older courses, and uh, there's no magic solution to it. And even though a lot of people are talking about it, I think this center could possibly be um, just another place where we try to figure out how do we wrap our arms around this, what are best practices for when I'm creating a new course, what's an easy way, like what are the 10 things that I should try to do, and what about going back and um, the legacy courses, which things do we convert, what do we not convert, you know, what's best practice in other universities as well. So I think it could be another, uh, another forum for those conversations and learnings. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I would extend it past accessibility to other things too as, you know, the, yeah, I think that that's part of what it could do, especially as it relates to accessibility, but other things that ebb and flow and change and we need to stay current with. Yeah, agreed. Hi, I'm Marlon. Marlon, Killen. can you use the mic? Because then it's the live streaming works. Sorry. I'm Marlon Killen from the Department of Psychology in the College of Arts and Sciences. One thing that is very, very uh, uh, exciting about Drexel University is that we have so many different kinds of uh, training and development opportunities that are, exist all around the university, but they're very fragmented. They're very uh, uh, unique to the specific goals, objectives, and agendas of the groups that develop those. What I'd like the Teaching and Learning Center to be is a central source for everyone at the university. So there needs to be some central place where everyone can go for, for training and development opportunities uh, at, that uh, from which these other unique kinds of trainings can link, mm -hmm. but there should be some centralized uh, training and development that occurs through the Center for Teaching and Learning. And at the same time, it should represent the kinds of needs that, that broadly speak to all faculty, regardless mm -hmm. of, of discipline, regardless of part-time or full-time status, regardless of on-campus or, or online status. Uh, but there should also be tiered uh, levels of opportunities for professional development depending upon uh, whether someone is a novice, whether someone is a mid-career, or someone is much more advanced in, in their opportunities. Uh, I'd also like to see the Center for Teaching and Learning uh, go beyond just teaching and learning for the classroom, but to also think about things like leadership and how to cultivate uh, mm. uh, academic leadership among our faculty. That's something I would need to hear more about. And Richard, I don't know if you want to say about what you've learned in your sort of scan of our environment about how many other places there are. You know, what, how big does the umbrella need to be to sort of have everybody under it that, that ex about what already exists at the university? To be honest, I, don't, I mean, I, every time I talk to someone, I learn about another new initiative <laughs> right. that keeps popping up. So I mean, in, in some sense, it's probably much broader than, than my limited conception of, of what I've learned. But that just speaks, I think, to. Yeah to the range of different things that are already being tried. But it, it, you know, at least everything, everything that has been mentioned so far, you know, I, there's some part of the university that's so, so like Laveau, for example, has a center for teaching excellence and they've done a lot of work building best practices around different curricular designs and sort of making one page sheets, which seems like a, you know, for, for different purposes. Um, uh, and it's just, just to think of one example. Yeah. So in terms of what's been mentioned already, there's probably somewhere in the university that's been fiddling with that and thinking about how to leverage all of those resources that are already and I, and I think that's one of the big challenges is, is, is whoever becomes the director of the Teaching and Learning Center to figure out how to, to create that kind of umbrella or canopy or whatever and how to have people feel comfortable that this is kind of one-stop shopping but not taking over or kind of wading into efforts that are already really good and underway and doing a good job. So. Okay, I, Don McEachern from the School of Biomed. Um, sort of three general comments. One is I hope the, the Center for Teaching and Learning will be broad-based. Uh, I noticed that people say experiential learning and yet it almost immediately focuses on us uh, as faculty instructors, but there is cooperative education, there is extracurricular activities. Those are the experiences that our students engage in and they're part of the learning environment. Uh, and we need to, to ensure that Steinbrate's part of the discussion, mm -hmm. that the extracurricular activities are part of the discussion, that we have a holistic view of uh, teaching and learning. Uh, two, um, I hope that educational research will also you know, play a role here. 
Um, we are a research institution, but we are unique in that we are a practical research institution. It goes from the lab to application, and that should be the same, I would think, with uh, the educational process, that we should have uh, research, we should align ourselves with uh, assessment to make sure that what we're doing actually works, that we evaluate whether or not it does or does not work. But I guess my, my major concern is sustainability. I've been here since 1984. Um, I actually am fossilized at this point. Um, and we've had initiatives of, of various types, TDEC from the College of Engineering, EBE in, in bioscience, really excellent examples of uh, innovation in, in education that simply weren't sustainable. They did not sustain. So whatever this center is, there has to be a plan to maintain it um, because we, we're very good at generating initial enthusiasm and everybody getting on board. But five years down the road, 10 years down the road, you want this thing to still be enthusiastic and effective. And I think that, that's a major issue or a major concern to me. I share that concern. Thank you. I'm Jim Mitchell, uh, also fossilized, came in 88. I started the first teaching and learning center, not under that name at Drexel. Um, and I have two observations. Oh, I am a faculty member and I'm also one of them. Uh, I'm the associate dean in the College of Engineering. Um, two observations, one for Provost Blake, I think that we're not going to get the kind of change that Don talks about until there are policies that connect assessment to some kind of reward system in the university. Right now, those of us who show up for teaching and learning sessions are those who are true believers, the ones who need it most as an example, we had a dean search meeting at the College of Engineering. There were no questions uh, raised about education at the dean search. It was all research. And until there is a change in the reward structure and assessment being connected to teaching and learning, we're going to have the same problem. The second thing, and this is me wearing my beanie hat, is that I don't hear a whole lot about the major changes that are coming in Provost Blake's field of the impact of technology, in particular the many uh, AI-related aspects of education that I believe could make a big difference here, and I would like to see this center put in place. Jim, I would, uh, I'm very Carlos Blake should feel free to grab the mic if you want. I did say you could leave. <laughs> um, but but um, I would say that for me, the indication that, that the university is getting serious about kind of assessments about teaching and rewards and so forth is that it's housed under the Office of Faculty Affairs in the Provost area. Um, and is connected to the sort of general infrastructure. This isn't something that's over here by, by itself. Um, and I see it as an integral part of what we do, both already with Alanda in, in development for faculty, um, but as the whole kind of faculty affairs. Um, but, but ultimately, it will rest in the public office. Hi. Hey, Lonza Flowers, School of Ed. Um, so as part of my doctoral studies, I was able to get a college teaching certificate as outside mm -hmm. of the School of Ed, and yeah. which was really beneficial because it came from the Bush School of Public Policy, <laughs> which was really interesting in itself uh, in the process of thinking about teaching and learning. But I was wondering, is that an option also is offering kind of a certificate for people to come in, and also students to come in and get this, this credential that would help them on the job market and also improve kind of faculty development on campus? It's absolutely something that I've been thinking about. Um, but that's something that would have to come from sort of the, the committee and the director. But you know, where I came from at Temple University, we had a same certificate in 
teaching in higher education, which was really useful to people when they went on the job market and could have a four-course certificate that said they'd had some training and background in pedagogy. And as you know, a fellow education colleague, um, I know that can be critically important. Not just, I mean, I think it can be important for, for graduate students who are doing teaching for us, but I think um, to it, other, other faculty ranks as well, and it can be a revenue generator for such a center. So I think it's a great idea. Hi, Ian. Hi, Ian Sladen, uh, Steinbright Career Development Center. Uh, I'd like to piggyback on some things that uh, Dr. McEachran had said, in, including having Steinbright uh, being part of the uh, discussion uh, of the center. Um, I've been here for almost 19 years, so not, not quite fossilized, but long enough to okay. see some, some changes and, and some changes that, that need to come about uh, at the university. One of the things I've discovered um, in, in my new role um, is that Steinbright has a tremendous amount of assets in terms of the data that we get back from our students coming off of co-op and also from our employer partners that give us feedback mm -hmm. in terms of our students' preparedness uh, for work, whether that's co-op or full-time positions. We've only begun, uh, truth be told, uh, as a center uh, um, to begin to disseminate this data in the hopes that it will uh, drive curricular innovation and better preparing our students mm -hmm. uh, for the world of work. So I'd like to see in time uh, over the next few years beginning to have this part of our DNA in the classroom. I know that we have some faculty that are very much involved in, in the experiential learning process and others that are maybe not barely aware that we are a school that has a cooperative education program. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see uh, the center support this initiative of having this really part of our DNA mm -hmm. in the classroom so that mm -hmm. um, the, the co-op experience is something that is discussed in preparation uh, for the world of work. And I'd like to see the, the center support that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we're missing a lot if we don't capitalize on that in our, all our teaching and learning. Hi, uh, Sandy Freeland, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education at the College of Arts and Sciences and Interim Head Department of Communication. Um, I want to echo something that's already been said, uh, Don brought up and Jim echoed, and that is I think one of the issues with the DCAE is it started off with a bang, it started off with a lot of good ideas, but it kind of fossilized, using your <laughs> term from a different perspective. We started doing the same sort of thing. We started yeah. seeing the same people at every session and was sort of like preaching to the converted. So whatever is undertaken needs to be dynamic. It needs to be continually innovated and updated so that we have new ideas that, that, that serve as part of uh, improving teaching at Drexel. Um, a, a couple of other things to, to come off what some other people have said. Um, I think that it's critical that we provide better um, structure and, uh, and teaching for our graduate students. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a workshop at the start of the year and we expect some departments to do, some departments do do training in communication, for example. All of our students, uh, doctoral students who eventually teach their own classes, serve one to two terms as uh, essentially being mentored by another faculty member in their classes before they're allowed to have their own classes. But I think we need to be doing a lot more to help our doctoral students become the good teachers that they need to be once they go out in the job market. Um, the other thing that, that I recall very vividly when I was in, in, in graduate school myself, I was involved in the development of a teaching and learning center at Carnegie Mellon University. And um, I think one of the most successful initiatives we undertook there was giving faculty the opportunity to be uh, recorded mm -hmm. and then meet one-on-one -on -one yep. with an expert to get feedback because you have no idea what you look like, how you sound, how you present yourself, where you stand, how you perform as a teacher until you actually see yourself. And it obviously needs to be done in a, uh, I don't know what's the best word, but in an, in an environment that, that, is, that is collaborative, it is not uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know, punitive in any way, or anything like that, so that uh, our new teachers in particular, but really all teachers can improve uh, the quality of their teaching. Great. Thank you, Sandy. Hi, I'm Deb Frank. I'm the Senior Assistant Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences uh, for Operations and Assessment. And um, whenever I, I see a teaching and learning center that doesn't also say teaching, learning, and assessment, mm -hmm. I get a little worried um, because I don't know how you know if learning has happened if there isn't assessment. So I know it's not popular, <laughs> but you know, I think they have to be integrated and um, in that if you're working on your teaching 
and want your students to learn, you also should be working on learning how to assess whether they are learning. Um, and that should all be together, it shouldn't be separated. Dana D'Angelo, I'm a clinical professor in LeBeau College of Business. I have been at Drexel since 1990, so almost fossilized maybe, as soon as we get into the 90s as the decade. Uh, I have been involved with uh, LeBeau's Teaching and Learning Center with the DCAE and have had the privilege of working with amazing people through the years, and I'm super excited about this initiative. Uh, a few things I wanted to add is that although we live in a virtual world and we have a lot with Duo and online, we do need to consider space. Yeah. And whether that is the virtual space, an extremely friendly and well done website that is interactive, very important. But we also have to think about physical space. Maybe offering the units that are all doing wonderful things the space to have their sessions so that the center becomes the go-to, not just for expertise, but the physical space. A wonderful environment, the way you walk into admissions and want to be there while you're waiting for your campus tour, it should be a place to want to go. Uh, and I do hope we can find some dedicated physical space because that's been missing for years and years. Uh, second is that I, I love the idea of the talk with um, all about the different units, but Drexel and the focus of Drexel has also been on our community. And we do have amazing resources here at Drexel, but we also have a larger community with many other institutions in this area. And I'm a big believer in leverage and collaboration. And if someone else is doing it well, let's join in. We have the ability to do a lot of networking. So I'd like to see the center continue to lead and be a part of the consortium and, and all the good things that our, our area schools are doing as well. The, the consortium is the temple. I mean, you want to say, people might not know what that is. The consortium is, uh, there is a tri-state consortium in the uh, tri-state area. Mm -hmm. uh, Drexel has been one of the major players along with Temple and Villanova, Widener, but essentially it involves uh, several dozen institutions mm -hmm. and schools. They have biannual meetings. And uh, they do a lot of really good work, and I think we could really, really lead the way with that consortium. But leverage, there's so many good resources that other schools have that we can share some things to. Um, the third point I wanted to make is that a lot of this is in the cell. It's about promotion. I am in the School of Business, so marketing, promotion is all there, and not just to each other. We can showcase and support each other and all the great things we're doing, but I think it's also a sell to who we're doing it for, and that's to our students. Um, one thing that struck me about a year or so ago, we were doing a session for the PA program um, with Pat Off over in mm -hmm. the, the PA program, running uh, a whole program for about 12 of his faculty. It was a four-week program, and it was based on peer review of teaching. We've, we've done some good things. I had a student in the back of the room at the time taking a makeup exam because I couldn't give it to her any other time. And I'm like, sit in the back of the room and, and just do it. And after she turned in her exam and she said, that was fantastic what you were teaching to all these other professors or the discussion. She said, why don't we know that our professors are doing that, that they care about our teaching and why don't more of them do this? And it really, really struck me that I think it's so important to make sure we're not just hearing from the students on what they want, but letting them know that we're doing it and not just for each other. Um, well, we're doing it for them. And creating so, a culture of inquiry, right? Exactly. So yeah, so with them. Um, yeah, so that was it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dana. Hi, I'm Jonathan Seitz in the History Department, and um, assessments come up a couple of, of times here, and one thing that I would like to see is that if we're hoping that faculty are going to um, evaluate the effectiveness of what they're doing, there needs to be, a, I think, a good bit of, of support for that because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a historian, I was taught how to do history, 
I think I'm very good at that, but I was never taught how to do a, a statistical analysis of my students' learning, right? And I think very few of us her, here were, except for maybe some of our colleagues in, in education. And I don't feel like I can learn that field, yep. right? And, and so we need, we need the tools, you know, we need the assessment instruments, mm -hmm. and we need people who we can go to and say, how do I know if, if this, these numbers mean anything, right? And that is something that there hasn't been, and yet there's, there is this sort of expectation that we should be checking on whether what we're doing is effective or not. But how do we do that? Right. right? And, and you should also know, I've, I work closely with Steve DiPietro in the Office of Inst Assessment and Institutional, I can't remember his whole title. Assessment. Accreditation. Accreditation. So, so this, the whole PAR process is part of that, and part of it's quantitative, but part of it's qualitative, and asking really good questions about how do we measure learning. So um, I, we, we have, other partners here at the university that would also be part of that effort within, that would be housed within a teaching and learning center. Yeah, but especially at the individual faculty level Absolutely. rather than the sort of yep. program level. Yeah, but that's at the program level, but some of those same things if you, you know. But yeah, I, I don't, I, I certainly can't imagine that we would be asking, you know, professors to learn a whole other discipline of assessment and there are people who do that and can help think with you about how to tell if your students are learning and learning what you want them to learn rather than other things. Thank you. Go ahead, Chris. Um, I'm Chris Adkins. Um, I'm with the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the College of Medicine. Um, Dr. Brian Wigdahl is our chair. And when I looked at the list of um, uh, groups that you talked with, I didn't see anything from the College of Medicine. Um, one of the things that I've noticed since I've been at Drexel since 2006 has been that most of the time when there are these committees, they only go down as far as the deans and maybe some managers, program directors. But the people who actually work directly with the faculty, such as the instructional designers, mm -hmm. there's several of us here, we never get invited to these meetings. And we're the ones that can further any policies or any mm -hmm. best practices or good practices. Mm -hmm. And we don't get invited. So I don't know whether or not at the College of Medicine, since it is the Graduate School of Biomedical mm -hmm. Sciences Professional Studies, that um, uh, our school tends to only deal with the deans. They never get down to my level. So you would not know that we conduct faculty training all the time for my group. You wouldn't know that we have an online teaching and learning center for our people. So if you don't talk to us, you're not gonna find out about the various pockets of expertise that are not necessarily faculty. There are a lot of people who are in the position, um, their position may not say instructional designer, or may not say you know a particular um, uh, job title, but we have the job of working with faculty, helping them to build courses, both traditional as well as online. So what I would hope is that the uh, New Tur Teaching and Learning Center would be more inclusive and include the College of Medicine and include instructional designers throughout this university that can be uh, there as an expert, they can be consulted, um, there's ways of doing that, and a lot of us would be willing to share our expertise. Thank you. I, I, I would say that also extends to CNHP, and you know we have we have three campuses, and so I think that's a, a much larger. It's a really good point, but a larger point than just medicine too. Yeah. Um, it's me again, the fossil. Um, I'd like to build a little bit on what you said in terms of instructional designers. Um, at one point. I was working with uh, folks uh, who knew animation because they were helping me develop new approaches to, to education and then there was a financial upheaval. We seem to have a fair number of those. And they disappeared. The office is reorganized so whatever animations I had gotten disappeared. I'm back to scratch. I don't know how to animate but I am seriously considering going back uh, and getting a certificate in how to do it because I cannot rely on resources from the university to fulfill that function. 
this would be a place to have that kind mm -hmm. of activity mm -hmm. if we have dedicated resources. There has to be dedicated resources. You can't do this with just enthusiasm. Right. And second, I, I, again, building up on what everybody else has said, uh, I think the term is functionally siloed in that we tend to have uh, discipline-specific operations, but we also tend to own our courses. If you talk to faculty, they think of a particular course as belonging to them. But the learning process is curricular. And so I'm ho I, I would hope that there's a level of curriculum design, a level of teamwork that can be done so that uh, the students can get these educational experiences at the developmentally appropriate time yeah. so that we can think more broadly than I can teach my course well, doesn't matter what anybody else does. Thank you. Richard, do you want to, did you talk with anybody at the med school or no? We haven't. I, uh, I don't know. It's I a haven't, question. no, although I have met with several uh, instructional design uh, uh, folks um, from various parts of the university or instructional technology and had a lot of ideas about ways that instructional right. technology can play a role school. in working with faculty and designing courses, but no, I haven't met with anybody. Hi, I'm Katarina Custis. Um, I work as an instructional designer at Duo in the Learning Technologies Group. I just heard us mentioned like 50 times in the past five minutes. Um, so I just wanna, um, if, if not everybody knows what we do, we take uh, content from faculty and we help engineer, reformat, and reorganize it so it's better um, in a delivery format for, for the students. And we happen to do that for the online portion though our strategies and techniques could be applied to face-to-face -to -face and hybrid classes as well. Um, I heard that some of you want to implement assessment into this new, um, new thing we're starting here. And I, we, we have a lot of strategies for making those assessments measurable with actions and so that the learning objectives match with how you assess a student gets there. Um, and I know that faculty has doctorates in their specific fields and we're here to come in with any type of content that you may have, we're not experts in the content, but we help you engineer it for the students so that they understand it as well because they don't have their doctorates, they're not as close to the material as you guys are and we're here to help you deliver that to the students. So please include us in this. Thank you, we are. <laughs> yes. I guess I'm back. Um, I was reminded while listening to this that money matters. Oh, yeah. And you brought up the, or I guess Don did, the E4 program. Many of the significant changes have been made via outside research mm -hmm. uh, grants, NSF in the case of E4. And I believe um, that there is significant interest out there and that we ought to be pursuing those as Castle is doing, I know, and that there are lots of opportunities and I would say that might draw in some of the people for whom research, research, and research are the only things that matter if there are opportunities to actually go after research funding. I, I'd agree. I think, I think the only sort of caveat I would have with that is that what I've heard is that, yes, money matters, but it's sustainable money, and that money's going to come and go, right? Um, and so I... I you know, I don't know how Provost Blake feels about it. He asked me to do this and said there will be funding for it. I'm meeting with David Unruh in a couple weeks to, to talk about um, institutional, you know, about advancement and what we could do uh, on that front. But I think that you can have all of the research money around teaching and learning that you want, but if there's not a sustainable sort of institutional commitment, I don't think that's going to give us the um, platform that we need to build what we want. I would say it's not either or. No, exactly, right. Uh, Dan King, Chemistry. So I um, chair your 
enthusiasm that having it located in the provost office um, is going to lead to an increased amount of resources. And hopefully that will help to fund permanent staffing yep. for this. Uh, but I do have a concern. Um, so shifting it to the provost office does um, create the situation that this could be a top-down mm -hmm. initiative um, of the administration telling faculty how to improve their teaching. And um, it, there can be some of that, but it has to be bottom up as well. And especially if you're looking for something sustainable, um, it's gonna have to go in both directions. Yep. Because if it's only, well, here's the provost office running another session, um, you're not likely to have kind of sustainable involvement. And just kind of one thing to you know, reinforce how important it is to kind of have faculty involved at all levels and keeping an eye on those kind of things. If you look at the timing of the two forums, I know. they're the exact same time on the same day of the week, which means anyone who is teaching right now cannot attend either of these two forums. So that's the type of thing that, it's one of the things that happened a bit with DCAE is that some of the scheduling worked around one person and so it locked out some people because if their teaching schedule didn't align with when those workshops, you were out of luck. Yep. And so the hope is that if it's you know, equally top down and bottom up, then you have the faculty who can point out, hey, don't schedule those two workshops at the same time. Uh, let's make sure that everyone gets a chance to participate. Thanks for pointing that out, Dan. The, the, I noticed that after the fact. And you might notice that we had the provost here who was really difficult. So that, I can blame it on Brian. And we are having an online one. I noticed that at the, too late to, to change it. And you're absolutely right. Um, I wish that we had one on a different day of the week. But I also hope that people will use the website. Use, and this is just the beginning of a conversation with a, that's, that's going to be ongoing. I just have a couple, couple um, things to build on that. And one is, I think you're already doing this, and that's great, is to uh, record, mm -hmm. yep. put the links up. Uh, I'm in a department where we teach online and in class, and they're having those kinds of opportunities for accessing material, whether they're in the workshop or they're after the fact, they can still participate, get almost the full benefit of it. So I think that that's great that you're, you're doing that. Um, what, was your, what was your other point? I, I had something to say. Uh, top down. Oh, the top, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm recovering sorry. from a cold. Uh, I think that one of the things that I experienced in another university where we had a research uh, teaching center in addition to the center having events, we also had tiny funding for our own teaching circles mm -hmm. where we could engage faculty who are teaching a similar kinds of courses. So for example, I was teaching health management, my colleagues in the management school were doing other kinds of business management and we had a, we created a business, I mean a management teaching forum. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of activities, even though it may not be the main avenue for engagement, but that definitely could be you know, from, from the faculty, whether, they're, whether that's full-time, part-time, online, on, yeah, yeah, so I think yep. that that would be a, a great way to engage faculty. Thank you. Agreed. Yeah, and we actually do some of that already, um, the, the activities that the DCAE has. Can I just kick in one specific suggestion? If you do a video, pay to get it transcribed. You can do it for a dollar a minute from okay. rev.com. So people won't watch videos unless they can scan to see really what's in oh, there. What's in, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to make an, another comment. Um, if you go online to some of the um, universities like Georgetown, um, Carnegie Mellon University, and um, there's the University of Michigan, I believe, there are several of them that have really, really robust um, what I would call teaching learning centers online. Mm -hmm. So yes, they have in-person type um, events, but they also have a lot of good material online for faculty that they can just access just in time. 
And that's something that um, really doesn't take as much money as what it does just dedication from a small subgroup of individuals who are interested in doing this and setting it, um, setting it up for us. And that is something, and I mentioned this to Aaron before, that is something that we can do you know, within six months. It doesn't have to be two years or three years. And this would provide a lot of information for faculty. The other thing that I wanted to say is that um, the young lady that spoke about um, what instructional designers do, I appreciate that. Um, it's not just for online, and everybody thinks that we only work online. I work with a lot of the traditional courses right now, or what we call web enhanced, where it's a traditional course, but they're using Blackboard or other types of instructional technology. So this center needs to include all types or modalities of, of mm -hmm. teaching. And the foundation is instructional systems development, good pedagogy, and it doesn't matter whether it's online or hybrid, if you have a, a good instructionally sound uh, course. Thanks, Chris. You know, one thing that struck me listening to all this, from people I know, because I know a lot of you, because we end up in the same spot all the time. It's the term is the usual suspects. And there's, there's a preaching to the converted element to this. And, and the problem, see if I can give you a, a sense of it. I used to, to go to all of the educational meetings in, in engineering, the American Society for Engineering Education, until I realized I could walk into most of the sessions and give them. Because I knew what they were going to say. It's what they said the last time, and the time before that, and the time before that. But bringing those back here and implementing them was a different story entirely. So when you put your envisioning committee together, I highly recommend that you literally proactively go out and find people who didn't volunteer for this and draft them. Because we need to reach not the people who already are interested, not the people who will work harder, not the people you know, who are here, but the people who are not here, and not because they're teaching, Dan, but because they don't think they need it, or they don't think they have the time, or it's really not a top priority. And yet they're the ones, they're the ones who would benefit. Well, I'm so not sure that, I mean, is, I'm, is are a you, big thing. I would just say that the, the, the nominations are open through tomorrow, and I would um, welcome um, more nominations of folks yeah, draft who your friends. are yeah. not necessarily <laughs> the, the people who show up at everything, but who care deeply about teaching and learning, and we'd be committed to working on the committee. The nomination information on the website, where you It's in the announcement that went out. Um, if there's a link in the announcement, you just click on the link. I don't know if we have, I don't think I have it on the slides. Um, and if you can't find it, just call our office or email um, faculty affairs at Drexel. Yes. I should speak from an assistant professor perspective for a second about the, someone mentioned the research and teaching and service component of how we evaluate it. I think it's really important if teaching is going to be a strong priority of the institution, there needs to be an institution value in that. Place not only in what we say as part of our 40% or 20%, but also in how we talk to that, talk about that to our assistant professors. And so when we talk about research, and we all know that if you were a assistant professor, you know, you're told, do your research, make sure your research is happening, and then teaching will happen and you'll be okay. And so I think there needs to be an institutional value placed on quality teaching and examples of that, what it looks like for young faculty coming in. And so either model it to, from, uh, model it from other faculty members or have a place where we can come and talk about the, the teaching and practices that are happening on campus. So I know coming from, uh, coming from a traditional program where I taught face to face to an online program, there's variations in yeah. how that process goes. And it's been, not difficult, but it's been an adjustment time for me. And I've been teaching for a long time. Yeah. And so I think to have a space for assistant professors, even professors in general, to have those conversations is really important. Agreed. Yeah, I think creating a culture around teaching that um, is part of the institution, or building on the culture that we have, I should say, because it's not as though we don't have a culture.
Kara Lindstrom with the Excite Center. Uh, I was in a conversation earlier today where we were talking about the differences across units in terms of incentive structures, evaluation structures of mm -hmm. faculty, requirements based on the type of faculty you are, whether you're adjunct, you're full, you're research, you're teaching, whatever, all these different criteria. And I, I, would, I would encourage the center to be um, a place that is looking and sort of a critical eye towards the provost's office um, in terms of helping the in between the individual uh, colleges and schools and their policies and the provost and the sort of university-wide policies because you can't mandate from the provost's office what all those different types of teaching look like by unit just because of the different disciplines and, and the different rigors across those units. But you have to, again, sort of to the culture building piece, have something that says you, you have to incentivize this with your faculty, college and schools. So it has to have a, something like a range of, right? So that this center is actually looking at both the college policies around teaching and excellence, but also the provost office and saying like, here, here's some recommendations or here's some good practices and showing them up and, and also reviewing any sort of university-wide approaches and saying like that really won't work for you know nursing or that really won't work for Westfall yep. um, because of the different practices of those faculty and and what those sort of faculty are composed of in terms of professionals versus academics and I think that's something those incentive structures this can be the place in between the units mm -hmm. um, to look critically at both of those and hopefully a little bit of transparency because again when you're working in a couple of units, you might not realize how different the incentives are on the other side of campus. Really different. Yeah. Um, so I think that needs that that could be somewhere that provides that sort of critical eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that idea of transparency is critical to the success of the center. There's nothing like a little sunshine uh, to. For sure. Um, one of the things is Kristen Imhoff, College of Engineering, uh, Associate Director for Assessment and Retention. I also run a tutoring center in support of our engineering. Uh, degree programs. One of the things that's been sticking in my mind a lot lately between my job and everything else is scale. Um, one of the issues I'm presently having in terms of assessment, um, not to go into specifics, but my smaller classes, 20 seats. My larger classes, 1,000. How does an instructor teaching a 1,000 seat class work with 15 other faculty to deliver common material to these students? And while I know this isn't engineering specific, I'm sure in arts and sciences, oh, yeah. At least arts and sciences, there are similar scenarios, but there's never that discussion of how do you support faculty in their teaching of these large scale classes while also effectively managing their peers. Um, and so also taking that into consideration given the variety of sizes we have of our courses here at Trexel. Um, and then myself personally, I've been a student in the College of Engineering, College, uh, School of Education, and I'm currently a student in the College of Arts and Sciences. And you can bet I'm constantly comparing the variety of delivery mm -hmm. between online, in-class, hybrid, size of the class, and the experience is always different. And I'm not saying the experience has to be same across the board, but we need to be supporting our faculty if we're going to expect them to be better teachers to be more effective in their delivery. And just to harp on what everyone else has been saying, it's not just the teaching component, there are the other elements. I really did enjoy the suggestion of having, um, not necessarily a certificate program, but um, professional development for faculty. And it wouldn't be just limited to teaching. It would also be um, the leadership aspect mm -hmm. of that as well. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Is anybody keeping count if I talk more or is Don? <laughs> um, last thought. I am impressed at how we're subject to the NIH syndrome. If we haven't invented it here, we don't want to talk about it. Mm. And yet there are large scale um, services and opportunities that we, I would argue, ought to be taking in advantage of the national surveys on student engagement, um, as well as a lot of things I'm sure I don't even know about that 
we just don't even begin to think about um, because it's all within the walls. Yeah, I, my graduate work was in higher education and I worked with people at the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA. Um, well aware of a lot of those and I don't think Drexel participates in SERP or with Harry. Yeah, and it's an amazing database. Yeah. But that's up to the community to choose to do that. Hi, um, Katerina again. Um, I just wanted, this is just something that I've been thinking about since I started at Drexel like a month and a half ago. Um, <laughs> but I know that instructional designers at Drexel, at least in the learning technologies group here at Duo, uh, we work on online and hybrid courses. But as what our jobs are, they don't have to be for online and hybrid courses. They could be for face-to-face. -face, and I'm wondering if Drexel already invests in instructional designers for face-to-face -face classes, or if we could use our methods to implement that, our strategies to implement that into face-to-face -face curricula as well. It's a cost issue. Yeah, but it's the same. See, the content doesn't change, and the strategies um, don't change as much for a face-to-face -face classroom, and I'm wondering if faculty <coughs> Um, we go in and we reformat some of their content and I'm wondering if they could use that and put it into their face-to-face -face curricula as well. They might. This is Dana again. I, uh, there's one word that has not come up in the last hour and I really like what I'm hearing about including assessment and including um, research around teaching and learning, SODAL, the scholarship. But the word that I haven't heard is global and international. And Drexel is already doing phenomenal, fantastic things in the area of international education, training faculty to teach abroad, to do global classrooms. Uh, so I also think that a huge stakeholder is the Office of International Programs. Mm -hmm. And I, I really believe that beyond experiential that we're combining that uh, international piece and, and not just because we want to throw the word out because it sounds good, just really looking to that, I'll mention before community, but that global community as well as the mm -hmm. Philadelphia connections. So mm -hmm. I'd like to see the center really Thanks. focused on that piece. Thank you. Can I accentuate that for a second oh. really quickly? One of the things that I find in my classes is that I'm dealing with multiple cultures in ways that I haven't in the past. So I can have students from different areas of the world. Their expectations, the way they process the information varies. And so I feel a little bit out of depth in how do I adjust my delivery in order to make sure that all the students in the class from the different cultural approaches are all adequately learning and so I would find it extremely useful mm -hmm. if some of that were in, available at, at this uh, Center for Teaching and Learning. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks, Don. Okay. Hi, I'm Stephanie from uh, the Director of the Learning Technologies Group at Duo. We met right, a long right, time right, ago, right. yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I have a very different perspective because I've been here for a while and I'm an adjunct, I was an instructional designer, I've supported various programs and colleges across the university for years. So I see different colleges doing it different ways as far as their online delivery and the way that they teach or the trainings that they might offer. Or, but the one thing I haven't heard today was standards and, you know, there was a, a comment about policy. So to me, I think about, well, you know, from the instructional design hat that I'm wearing, I look at it like, what is the purpose of the learning center, learning and teaching, if we don't really have standards? And if, I mean, I think about quality matters, and that was pushed so long ago. We went through training, the university yeah. invested in it. We, we trained our faculty fellows, and they go through course reviews. I mean, it, this was years of, mm -hmm. of commitment to that, but we don't do it. 
and nobody's being forced to do it. And I mean, we say like quality matters, but really we don't. I mean, we try to, and we've in, in, the instructional designers have integrated that into our policies and to our processes that we follow as far as course design, but that's not really a stamp of approval or something that's being pushed from the top down. This is why I feel personally that the Teaching and Learning Center is gonna benefit coming from the provost's office because that way they can actually say, this is what you're gonna follow and this is the standard across the university that we need to employ and if you don't do this, then this is gonna backfire in many ways. So I know that in an instructional design standpoint, we like to have courses look consistent, be consistent. They aren't, because every college does it very differently, and that's okay. But I do think if we are at least communicating across the university, we do follow quality matters. We do have a standard for the quality and the level of the courses that we, mm -hmm. that we are turning out. Like, I think that speaks volumes, and we just don't. So to me, I would, I'd like to know what the vision, what the mission is. What is this center really gonna be if we have no standards? Is it just like, hey, come and get help when you need it? I, I don't know, I don't know what that big picture is. So I'm just kind of giving you my perspective on it um, from a very different and, perspective and than a faculty. I would say that that's the, that's the process that we're engaged in to figure out what that mission and vision is. Because I, I agree with Dan, I don't think that if the provost said, we're gonna have a teaching and learning center that's gonna do this, this, and this, um, you'd have as good a, a chance at buy-in for the faculty. Because as you know, um, if you tried to tell faculty you need to do X, what happens? Faculty are a very independent hey, group, right? And so there's a, there's a, there's a process involved um, with that. So, and I think that that's part of why we're approaching this in the way we are, um, to have open town halls, to try to generate a shared vision, a shared mission around a teaching and learning center. And there's still a lot of work left to, to do to do that. Hi, Tim Siftar Hi, from Tim. the library. I work with the School of Education and CCI and Global Studies in Modern Languages. And I want to shout out to my instructional designer buddies across the hall, woo! Because uh, there's this thing that happens, and it started in the School of Ed, and, and, and as, uh, as that crew kind of uh, bought a broader portfolio it's uh, been moving around with uh, not just myself but other librarians as well, is that there's this synergy that happens between the faculty and the instructional designers and then you get a librarian in the mix and ooh, what, what new products are there? And frankly, the most productive uh, interactions I've ever had with faculty when they're uh, optimally receptive to new uh, textbooks and ebooks and open educational resources and so forth is when they're in that in that course redesign moment or the new course design moment, you get your uh, multimedia people in there, the, uh, the uh, instructional designers, mm -hmm. and it all seems to gel. And I just want to say there's something magic about yeah. that, and the um, instructors feel so cared for and supported, it's, it's a delight. You and know, it's, it's exciting. It, it it's is exciting. exciting. It's and really so it's, exciting. it's a very yep. different experience than you know, opening an empty course shell and staring at the, you know, right. the blank pages. And, and there is a lot of support here. I think it's a matter of marshalling it and encouraging, incentivizing, and um, uh, and then a little bit of problem solving. Like if there's, oh, there's a database of videos that already does that le little lecture <laughs> series that you were gonna spend a lot of time creating originally. So uh, sharing this knowledge, we've got it here. I think we can we can leverage it, so thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah. So I wanted to, Quick comment about the question earlier about can the methods that are being developed in Duo be used in face-to-face? -face? Um, obviously many of them can. I think one of the benefits of this type of center would be to provide that general resource where people could go in and tap into expertise yep. from others. Because right now everything's very siloed. If you look at you know a lot of the online innovations that are being developed, they're, they're billed as online. And so unless you know that you can use it right. in your face-to-face -face class, it's not sold that way. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is, um, or ask, is is there a place for the students in this center? So tutoring is an issue. <laughs> we don't have any resources. We don't have any space. Um, is that part of the umbrella, or is this just a faculty professional development Center. 
Uh, you can make arguments for both, but that's something to consider. Is this a place for um, resources that directly impact the students and not indirectly? That's a central question that I expect the committee to take up and one that I think needs to be wrestled to the floor. Um, different models, both good. Barbara? My comment builds on a couple different comments about uh, people being assistant professors and needing direction about policies and how to structure things. I can say I, uh, in my college, in the co I'm Christine Mulhorn in health administration in the CNHP, and one of the things we do is for our non-tenure uh, non track faculty, we require for promotion uh, that those faculty have two areas of excellence and one of them is, is teaching. And it is not top down, but there are multiple ways that faculty can demonstrate that excellence in teaching. Mm -hmm. And one of them is by addressing concerns that they have in their evaluations. And in the past, we used to go to the DCAE and then demonstrate how you incorporated those, those stra new strategies. Uh, I also talked to uh, uh, junior faculty about the accessibility content, because I was on that committee and I find that really highly valuable. Uh, but also there are other, other strategies and they can find things from their colleagues or from other places. They can find new ideas that are enhancements like gaming and other things and we have faculty supporting that. So to me, a Center for Learning and Teaching would be, would be a resource that not new faculty but also chairs could go to to know what resources are available and what kind of strategies faculty could take on to uh, make sure that they can demonstrate that excellence in teaching. And so it doesn't mean that there's only one way to do it. Uh, and quality matters is another thing that we encourage, but we know that faculty don't have time to do all of those things, but at least they can, they have strategies to do it. And I really liked, just to pick up on, I think it was Marlon who mentioned that there could be different levels yep. based on experience. And I think that that's a really good point too, but I don't wanna repeat what other people are saying. Lindsay Matias, Center for Learning and Academic Success Services. So we are one of those many units around campus that does do some tutoring. Um, and I want to thank you all for you know, bringing us to the table, letting us you know, be part of this discussion. Um, but one of the things I had in mind as we were talking about um, students in particular is teaching assistants. Yeah. Because the way individual departments and schools and even courses approach te teaching assistantships varies wildly. Yeah. And I think that that is somewhere where potentially this initiative can really come into play and have a huge impact. And I know that you all are having open forums specifically for students. And I think it's really important, those of us in the room who work with peer educators or undergraduate TAs, encouraging them to get there, doing that good outreach um, because they are really on both sides of the coin. They have incredible insights about being an educator and receiving a Drexel education. And so I just hope that those students turn out for these um, forums uh -huh. so that we can really have their voice. Yeah. I also think, that, that, so the other thing that we're doing is that we're in conversation with the graduate college. Mm -hmm. who oversee, so, so I think there's um, nice synergy there. And I think it's, again, important in my opinion that it's in the provost portfolio because those all are mm -hmm. sort of under the same. Yeah, absolutely. And I just know the having worked with students across campus in different schools, some yeah. of them have TAs who are undergraduate, some of them are receiving a great deal of training up front, yep. some of them are receiving what is a fairly minimal amount of training, yep. and maybe having some standards as we're thinking about that, or at least norms um, for what our, um, what our TA ships look like and yep. what the expectations are for both undergraduate and graduate student TAs. Thank you. And further, just to piggyback on what Lindsay said, is perhaps having a student on the committee or a student voice oh, represented okay. on the committee to yeah, have them yeah. Please th give that input. If, if you don't have a particular student, if you could fill out a nomination form sure. and say a student, or if you do have a student yeah. in mind, um, that's a great suggestion. Thank you very much. In the back. Hello, my name is Christian Reed. I'm the uh, Director of Multimedia Services in the Learning Technologies Group. I don't know, we've kind of touched about like the research aspect. I can't speak on the more um, faculty-based research as far as like, I guess I'm thinking more of like book research and data research, but I think there should be a place where the technology is kind of 
put there for almost like a maker space or a lab where the mm -hmm. faculty can come experiment with yep. the technology and uh, actually have the freedom to fail with the technology yeah. and then maybe we could share that yeah. that space where the faculty can even demonstrate um, how technology worked and I think that would kind of help get the faculty buy-in as far as you know empowering the faculty to be able to use the technology and embrace the technology even if they don't know about it. Great, thank you, great idea. I love the idea of a, you know, have the freedom to fail with a new new thing, whether that's a technology or a certain pedagogy or you know, any of it. It's great, thank you. Oh, it's 4.15, my time. Just so if there's last, uh, you know, we have another 15 minutes or so. If there's burning questions. Put a damper on it, didn't mean to. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, really appreciate the engagement. Please do two things. One, encourage your colleagues um, to come to the next town hall, which is on February 12th um, from 3 to 4.30. If they can't make that, we will make known the date of the online um, town hall. And please nominate people that you would like or think would be would be good, or you'd like to see on the envisioning committee? Yeah. Uh, I just didn't see anything on your website. I just checked on Twitter and uh, There was an announcement that went out to the entire university community, or maybe it just went to faculty. Actually, maybe that's why you didn't get it. Yep, we'll get it up on the website. Or yep. you can email faculty fairs. Yeah, let me. Um, yep. Oops, sorry. Here's the email if you'd like your visual learner. Thank you very much for Thank coming. You for coming.